welcome, hello, ladies and gentlemen, non-binary folk and gender diverse people. Welcome to a very special QT event today where we celebrate our sis, sovereign storyteller, Malanjali and South Sea Islander, Professor Chelsea Watergo, and the launch of her new book, Another Day in the Colony. Folks, my name's Kevin Yaoyi. I'm a proud Waka Waka and South Sea Islander man. I'm a research student here at QUT. I'm a friend and colleague of Professor Watergo. And today I have the privilege and honour of being your MC and sitting in the hot seat with Prof herself. Folks, I know there's a lot of people in the room who may have never been to a book launch before and, and not sure how they operate or what goes down. And that's okay, because nor am I, nor have I, and I'm here hosting the thing. So we'll just jump in the driver's seat and see where we end up. Right. Um, folks, as I look around the lecture room, and I'm mindful not to um, go down this woe us kind of thing, but I know there has been times where we haven't always been able to get together. Um, and I know there are mob online as well who are joining us from all across so-called Australia, and especially our mob down um, in those southern states who have been doing it tough. So uh, a big shout out to them, but also a good ways, a big shout out to us to be here and um, to look around and just see so many staunch black fellas coming to support is um, you know, really something. You know, we've got Uncle Shane Coggle in the, in the house today. Thank you, Uncle, for joining us. <clears throat> we've got Himba Yumba here, all the way from the west side. Himba Yumba is made up of, is an independent school, so I'm told by the students. And uh, we've got about uh, 20 students present today, um, many of whom are interested in writing. So what a great event to come to because they don't get much better writers than Professor Chelsea Watergo. So thank you for joining us. <laughs> Folks, we have, we have, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> We've got uh, Inala Wongaro 4077. Big shout out. And Mrs. Brady, don't be looking my direction too, because I'll start crying. So you just look that way, please. <coughs> uh, we have Dr. Melinda Mann in the house today, folks. Uh, if, if you are a part of Black Follow Twitter, um, you will know Dr. Mann from, uh, from there. We also have uh, Aboriginal and South Sea Islander journalist and PhD candidate, Amy McGuire. Thank you for joining us. Folks, I'm, um, I'm mindful, with an event titled Another Day in the Colony, we, we cannot go any further without first being grounded in Indigenous sovereignty. So on that, I'd like to make welcome our uncle and QT Aldern residents, Uncle Chegg, to the stage. <clears throat> And this is your mark, Uncle. Is that my mark? Yeah. It's for <laughs> hey. Hello, everyone. So my name is Gregory Eggert, or as I'm known in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island community of South East Queensland, Chegg, or Uncle Chegg. Firstly, I'd like to pay respects and acknowledge elders past and present present. Isn't there some elders in this room? Some really, really distinguished ones in this room today, including my big brother, cousin here, Mr. Shane Cordell. So, I am an Aboriginal man from Kurumpu, Yagara and Kabi Kabi country and the inaugural elder in residence at the Queensland University of Technology. DT, of course, stands on the lands of the Turbo and the Agra people, lands that sovereignty was never ceded. So my position displays QT's recognition of our connection 
our people have to this land and the respect for our culture, knowledge and experiences. Today I'm honoured, honoured, I think I'm more than honoured and privileged to join with you today. Sorry to have my back to you. You're right, <laughs> Absolute privilege to be at this launch of Professor Chelsea Wadigo's book, Another Day in the Colony. Please use this as an opportunity to listen and gain wisdom within Professor Wadigo's story and truth telling. With that said, I'll say a few words to welcome you to this country. This is Aboriginal land, not in the past, but now. The spirits have shaped the land. And this can be seen if you look and experience and where the spirits dwell are sacred places. Australia is a place of the oldest living culture on this planet, and we are its people. We are to the west of the Yagra, Yagra Pool and Turbo people and more. To the east, we have the Grumpool, the Nunakal, Nogi people and more. South, we have Mullanjali, Gitabal, Bunjalung, Yugambe people and more. And of course, to the north, we have the Kabikari, the Bachala, the Waka Waka people and more. We are the descendants and we are to be recognised. This is Aboriginal land, always will be Aboriginal land, a spiritual land, and we are its people. So with that said, I can't wait for this book launch. Especially as Professor Wadigo was part of our staff now. <laughs> Which might mean something or what means nothing to other people. But it's a pleasure to have you and it's my pleasure to be here. So without saying any more words, I'd like to say a few words in language, which is boboka, biboka, sorry, can't even say it today. I said that's excited I am. Boka Biboka, which means welcome, welcome to this country. And I'm delighted to be here with you today. Thank you. Folks, keep the round of applause going. Uh, before we go any further, we, um, I'd like to introduce to the stage a Pro Vice Chancellor for Indigenous Strategy, Angela Bunny Leach, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Let's just say, I reckon the Twitter sphere is just blowing up right now, Chelsea. I mean, how many of us have been waiting for this day and saying, when can we put our book order in, you know? Come on, it's like, come on, come on. So I'm really pleased that today we're finally launching uh, Chelsea's book. And um, as the Pro Vice Chancellor, I'd just like to welcome you here today, but I've just got a few words to to say. Um, I think it's always good if for country to hear language because um, language kind of heals country and it's good for all of us to, you know, think about, you know, we're strong, we have that language. So Dalatali, Pro Vice Chancellor, Indigenous Strategy, Nugul QUT. So I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor here at QUT. Enkel Wapobara Nugul, Uncle Ched, Ata Nugul, Yagra, Tali Baragan, Gaba Nugul, Turubul Yagra. I thank Uncle Chegg for welcoming us here today on the lands of the Turubul and Yagara people. Yanga, Wanagan, Murubin, Gabada, Karendin, online, 
we don't have a word for online. <laughs> <laughs> Dala Mianjin Irubu Banda launch of Professor Chelsea Wadigo's book, Another Day in the Colony. So what I just did then was just to welcome you all here, welcome everyone from north, south, east and west, and welcome everyone online. I know there's about 200 people thus far online. So um, this is how, I'm sure there's more watching than that now, Chelsea, but this is pretty big. So I just um, also want to acknowledge the people in the room. I'm not going to go through them all, but I do want to say... Um, Uncle Shane, who's here, that everyone's mentioned, and Himbi Yamba, and Inala Wangra, who's just been such a big part of um, Chelsea's journey and a big part of Chelsea's life. So this book launch is important as it is a book that provides in some ways an oppositional narrative to the one that pervades many of Australia's commercial media and the voices of popular social commentators about us. This book is a black voice, a truthful and insistent voice that places a spotlight on people who are empowered, resilient, who see and not just are seen and are truly sovereign. This narrative aligns with QUT's priorities of recognising Indigenous Australians to engage successful and empowered people and by doing so, we will recognise and foster Indigenous excellence. Thank you for that, Chelsea. Chelsea's been giving us feedback since she's been here. And I'm <laughs> just... That doesn't sound like Chelsea. It's just like Chelsea, hey. Showing, showing that sovereign voice, walk in the gate, please change this. And this is what it should be. <laughs> <laughs> so one of QUT's guiding principles in our new Australian plan, um, Indigenous Australia plan, is sovereignty which recognises the sovereignty and rights of Indigenous Australians to self-governance and ensure that they participate and have control over decisions that affect them and influence the, the strategic direction of the university. So that's right. It's not just the universe. It's not just the Indigenous places within the university that Indigenous people should have a voice. We should have a voice over the whole of the universe. So... In Dr. Wadigo's book, she talks about retiring hope and being sovereign. The plan for QUT is to be a place that sovereignty is part of every day, is a place where Indigenous Australians realise their power and where fights for black causes are applauded. And if you want to know more about that, read chapter six, <laughs> which is called, I'll just say F hope in case I'm being recorded, which is called F beep, beep, beep. Hope. <laughs> so, I have been eagerly awaiting the release of this book, and as Larissa Barrett comments on the front cover, it is confronting, generous, moving, and insightful. And let me add, that is much like the author who wrote the book. I first met <laughs> Professor Wadigo, a Mullah Jali South Sea Islander woman some time ago, and what struck me was her solidness in identity in both a black and white sense and her sense of community. Chelsea was with me in a black sense. Yes, Chelsea, you are solid. I congratulate you on the launch of your book, which is both powerful and personal, definitely insightful, or maybe it's a bit of an expose in some parts of it, um, of an Australia that believes it is well hidden. This book this is the book that all Indigenous Australian undergrad, undergraduates should be reading so that you are sovereign in your learning throughout QUT, sovereign in your learning throughout whichever university that you are at, so that you understand the power within you and the sovereignty of our people. Chelsea, I wish you all the best with this book and for the many that are yet to come. <laughs> So, what are done, Murubin, Gabada, Karendin, Yanjin, Irungu, Banda, Another Day in the Colony. Let's celebrate this incredible book, Another Day in the Colony. Okay.
Okie dokie. Here we are. We're here. In the driver's seat. Got my tissues. Shut up. Yes, you got your tissues. Um, first things first, Chelsea, you look amazing. Thank Hello. you, Kevin. <laughs> Our prep work for today went like this. <clears throat> what are you wearing? <laughs> <laughs> what colours? <laughs> Send me a photo. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but Chelsea, um, honestly, congratulations. I know um, this is a, a project that you've been working on for quite some time. Um, and I first want to congratulate you on the, the, the launch of the book, but also not only was Another Day in the Colony launched yesterday, but folks, for those who don't know, it's actually gone into reprint. Um, so that means they had to print more books on publication day. <laughs> Kelsey, my yes. sister, Another Day in the Colony has become quite the hashtag on Twitter. Um, I've seen it used around the place by black ballers who side-eye each other and it, it's almost become a shorthand to um, talk about the audacity of some white folk in the colony. Um, tell us, how did Another Day in the Colony come about? It's obviously the title of your book and something that cruises around Twitter. Yeah, um, I can't remember exactly. It was a few years ago, but I'm pretty sure it was a conversation with Dr Mann. Um, and she's like, that's a thing. And it just took off. Um, and took off in all kinds of ways. Like we use, um, on Blackfella Twitter particularly, we use Another Day in the Colonies, a hashtag, and we use it to laugh about some of the ridiculous things that happen. Um, we use it to um, declare the violence of some of the stuff as Blackfellas that we face every day, to, to name it, that it's not about us or our dysfunction or our problem, it's about the violence of a settler colonial state. Um, so it, uh, what I like about the, the hashtag and what it does for blackfellas is it reminds us and them that what is being done to us is not about who we are as a people. Mm. It's a reflection of the society in which we've been forced to exist within. And so there's something freeing about knowing that the violence we experience is not because of our making. It's not about imagining um, and it's not our fault. And uh, there's, there's something just freeing about that because this, this world will tell us um, that it is, that we're the problem. They'll make movies about us being the problem. They'll write books about us being the problem. You'll find them in libraries everywhere, a whole genre of texts about black people being the problem in this place. Um, and all we, all we did was exist here. Um, and so there's something about that. It, 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 it does something um, beyond being a hashtag in terms of what it does to black souls and bodies every day in this place. Absolutely. Charles, um, in, in Another Day in the Colony, you talk of, and, and not just in the book, but you talk to all of us when you're growling us um, about our writing and <laughs> I don't other do things. That, <laughs> Kevin? Um, <laughs> yes, she does. <laughs> um, you talk about the importance of um, writing from a place. Um, your book opens up about um, what life was uh, living, uh, growing up in the other suburbs of Brisbane. You talk about place in terms of moving to Dolby, um, where you were first arrested. The first time. Uh, first. <laughs> There's several. There's more to, more to come. A few occasions. Like I said, it's a different kind of book launch, folks. <laughs> uh, Dr. Watergo up late. No, um, <laughs> no not that one. <laughs> uh, you talk about place. You talk about Dolby. You talk about returning to Anala, where Matthew um, joined the academy. Yep. You talk about physical space or, or lack thereof um, at the University of Queensland when you were working there. Can you explain to us why it is so important to, to be grounded in place and um, not just for your writing, but for your identity? Yeah, um, and I, th I thought, I guess the, I wrote from geographical places, um, but I also wrote from an emotional place as well um, during this, which I'll probably speak to. Um, I always remember years ago reading this piece by Ian Anderson, and um, he's a black academic, and he wrote this thing where he said, you know, protocol. Um, usually um, our right to tell a story is earned by explaining our relationship to that story. And it always stuck with me um, and it resonated for me is that, you know, mob will pull you up if you talk about something you've got no connection to. Like, hey, what do you know? Yeah. You know, and so... I always reread tweets and I go, should I be writing about this, reading? Yeah. You know, like we always have to have a relationship to what it is that we speak about. So for me, it would be unfathomable to write about something that I'm, that it's not, where I'm not from or not connected to or have a relationship to. Um, and so it's those experiences and those places is not to like universalize my experience as this is how it is for everybody, but that how I come to understand this place is because of the places that I've occupied, the experiences that I've had. And I try and use the different yarns to 
to um, show how I come to understand things and not to say that this um, is the ultimate thing. And I, I just remember um, Yannick Bakushain when um, he generously read every page of the book um, in its draft form and I was kind of like, um, I was frightened, but, um, but I remember at one point I said, what do you think? And he said to me, what's well, your story? Like, I can't, that's your story. Um, and it's, it made me feel um, better about what I was writing about, that I wasn't taking someone else's story and claiming it as mine or claiming to know it better than they ever could. Um, but the other place that I wrote this in, I, I wrote it, um, I talk about it in the intro, is I wrote it um, while I was on sick leave, um, which is, yeah. Um, but <laughs> Writing books is what you do on sick leave, right? <laughs> Um, it was, a, it was, I think it was almost like just over a year ago that I returned to work, but I had a, a few months off and I didn't understand what was going on. Um, and it was almost as though my body had betrayed me. I just couldn't, I couldn't function the way that I normally do. And, um, which those who know me know that that does, I just can't, I'm not good with that. Um, and, um, I, I saw the doctor and they just said, you need to take leave. And, but before I took the leave, I went on the drum and drag some fella. Ah, I think, that, I think that that's when they were saying too. like slavery didn't exist or something. Yeah. Um, and um, then I caught up with our research team and we had, and I think you were there, we had dinner oh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, and yeah. kind of went, okay, I'm, I'm taking a step back. And I had, that's when I had to get Wild Black Woman, yeah, work yeah. for a while, um, longer. Like there was, it was, it was a really um, challenging time. I didn't understand what was going on. Um, and, um, but I used that time that I had, those couple of months to then write a book and, I learnt about the importance of writing from the place you're in. Like there's no good place to write. Sometimes we think when we write it has to, everything has to be perfect and all the environment has to be like this and we have to have everything set up. And I write from that place. Um, and I talk about, you know, typing through the tears and, and you know, like just like write from the place that you're in. Um, you don't have to be in someone else's voice or someone else's experience. You just speak from that place because um, you know it to be true. Yeah. Yeah. Sis, you what I love and I love so much about this book, but what I love in it is that you're so generous in terms of um really talking about your relationships. You know, you talk about Marrow Johnson um and, and holding the line and not wanting to be the, the, the break in the chain. You talk about um Uncle Shane, but also Annie Lilla and in, in the work that um in the way that she helped shape your writing, your thinking around this book. You talk about, you know, the nights at three AM in the morning in the valley, um, in different episodes. That was the second arrest. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I wasn't going to say it. I was like, oh, yeah. spoiler alert! Yeah. Spoiler alert! Spoiler alert! There's a couple of arrest warrants in here. The race discrimination case is still active, so <laughs> yeah. we so we're going to be mindful about what we say about that too. Um, I'm not joking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very real. <laughs> Chelsea, how important and how much has your relationship with black colours, not just in the South East Corner, but also across so-called Australia, physically and online, help influence how much you? have written about in here? Um, well, everyone gets a mention. Uh, this shout outs. I'm in trouble. I'm sure I've missed a few people. Yeah. Um, uh, well, the thing is, so coming to the academy, to universities like this, um, ind Indigenous knowledges don't sit here. There are books written about us. They've constructed a way of understanding and knowing us from their vantage point. But our knowledge, our stories about ourselves aren't here. I mean, they're, they're, we speak of them, but they're not on the bookshelf in the libraries, um, whether it's a university library, a public library, wherever. Um, our knowledge is sitting in our conversations at kitchen tables, um, 4 a.m. in the valley. Um, We've had a couple of those. Everywhere and anywhere. And so I didn't look to, um, you know, cite what academics said. Um, as though they were the keepers of all knowledge. I recognise that all black fellows are keepers of black knowledge and um, I didn't buy into this idea there's a hierarchy of knowledges and that somehow um, this place can know us better than we can know ourselves. Because that's dispossession, right? The idea that we can't even know ourselves um, and, and know our own experiences. And so um, my intellectual idols are, of course, Uncle Shane Cobb, are, of course, Annie Little Watson. Of course, Mara Johnson, like just all these conversations. Of course, Vernon R. Key, who framed a whole chapter. Um, these, these are our thinkers, um, and we all are. And so there's something really um, exciting when you, know, when, you, when you come to accept that only we can know ourselves better than anyone else. And, uh, and I hope that's what it does for people that, yeah, um, being an academic, it's, that's a thing, but it's, in terms of our knowledge, that's something else.
Um, and so people say this isn't an academic text, and I've even said it, but it is. It, it's, it's... Well, I was listening to your interview with um, Professor Larissa Barrett, and she says, um, you know, it's important that we, we don't subscribe to Western standards of what academia or knowledge is, and this is why Another Day in the Colony should be regarded as, you know, a, a pretext for all undergraduate students, and I'd, I'd argue not just for university students, but also students coming through high school as well. Definitely. Um, you've got children here today, Charles, your tribe are here, your mum and your sister's here. Um, how and much? And they're really excited to be here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, can you just keep it down right over there, here. please? Yeah. Settle down, guys. I can't hear you through all the excitement. You wait till we get home. <laughs> Charles, how much has um, birthing black children, being a black mum, shaped your thinking, shaped your operating in this world? You talk about place, you talk about relationships. How has you know, having a tribe of kids. Influence Literally a tribe tribe. of kids. Um, uh, well, yeah, I mean, it's um, the having to think about what you tell your kids about this place. Um, and I know I grew up in a house, and shout out to mum who's here, um, who's in the book, um, grew up in a, in a home where we were told things about the world. Um, we were told some, you know, hard truths about the world so that we knew how to, how to I'm not going to look at them, they make me cry. <laughs> so, so I'm not going to look at just now. good ways. Um, <laughs> But, you know, we were taught, um, told some truths about the world, but it, I think there were times where I think we were protected from some of the truths about the world so that we could survive in the world. Because um, when you deal with the truth of this place, it can be hard to get up. Um, so as a parent, I had to think about, well, so what do I tell my kids? Um, but in the course of that, um, I've also then learnt from them about how to think about this place. And so Chapter 1, Don't Feed the Natives, features Maya's drawing. Um, that they did in grade two um, of our family um, outside our gunya. With the red frock. Red frock, boomerangs and spears. And um, and um, with my permission, I'd used it in teaching um, and to tell a story about when they were asked to draw a picture of their culture, what they knew to produce at, in grade two, having two black parents living in a black community, um, being exposed to some highly sophisticated conversations at the kitchen table about Aboriginality and, and the violence of colonialism. Um, so, you know, we, we, we had children who were aware, but at the same time by grade two produced this representation of us that didn't reflect where we actually live. Um, but, um, and I won't spoil it, um, but in the course of this, I had to think about that story and how um, what I did as a parent in terms of what, how I can look at that picture differently. Um, and so I've, I've learned from my kids as well as thinking about what I teach them. Absolutely. And look, I've seen some of your kids' stuff online and I don't know how you keep it together because um, Maya's uh, gray, uh, high school um, captain speech a couple of weeks ago was phenomenal. And I remember rolling, uh, look, at, yeah. <laughs> I remember looking at the recording on my phone and going, yep, that's Chelsea's kid. <laughs> I'm like, yep, that's her. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's her. Um, Chelsea, in terms of, I mean, you talk about Chapter 1 and you do really set the scene. You talk about um, the relationships that are uh, most close and dear to you. Uh, you talk a lot about kitchen table yarns um, with your folks, um, especially your dad and, and reading the local paper and then spar sparring afterwards. What, what kind of influence? <laughs> they, know the, they know the violence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, what, you know, in, in what ways does that help shape? And um, what you do really well in here is you talk about the uh, outer suburbs of Brisbane, but you also talk about um, it being on the boundaries of, you know, um, Meandin, but also your your country, Yugen Bay country, Mullandali woman. How has your dad's influences and your conversations at those kitchen tables really shaped this stuff? Oh, he's in the whole book, mm. perhaps except the last chapter, if I don't think would approve of the F hope thing. Um, sorry, Dad. Um, uh, he, he's, you know, um, throughout it all um, in all kinds of ways and just in, in conversation with him at times, but also sharing some of his experiences, you know, um, uh, having to think about, um, and not just what he said, um, it's the experience of racism in, in black homes. And I talk about it being a sensory kind of thing. Um, you feel it when it comes in the house. Um, you, you can smell the, 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 I still remember the smell of the engine of the truck when it's been a bad day, you know, so it's, we all knew that sound, um, you know, so that um, 
so I, I um, reflected on the experience of racism that had entered our house um, as kids growing up and the, the strategizing around trying to keep it at, at the front door, outside the front door as opposed to letting it come in. Um, and so I learned a lot from dad, both in um, what he said and what he told us um, about surviving up in this place. And, and he was raised at a time where it was still legal to discriminate on the grounds of race. Um, so when I look at some of the differences and how I might think about things, it's because of the way in which this place is situated, that it's different. I'm in a different time um, in some ways. Um, so there are different levers that I might use that were just not available to him at that time in order to provide for us as a family. Um, so I'm kind of in conversation with him um, throughout around some of the strategizing on how to um, uh, deal with racism. There are limitations to how I can understand his experience um, being uh, fair skinned, being a woman. Um, there are things that I can do that were just never available to him as a, what Aunty Jackie Huggins refers to a cosmetically apparent Aboriginal man. So his navigation of this, this, this world was very different to mine in, in some respects. And I got to watch it. Um, I still remember um, we, like we've lived at Runcorn and there's coals up the road. And as kids, we'd mostly go shopping with mum. And every now and again, dad would take us to this, the same shops to get something. And I would notice as a, like I would have been eight, um, I would notice that the, the checkout chicks, like they would talk to mum, they'd have that back and forth and talk really nice. And when I was with dad, he would really go out his way to talk nice to them. And they just wouldn't even sort of acknowledge his humanity. And I, it used to make me really wild because I, I knew them from when I was with my white mother. And I saw how different they were. And so growing up in that environment, I was, I was just always seeing, hang on, the rules work differently in these different contexts. And that's how I came to, to learn about race. I didn't read up on critical race theory, as, as some of the more learned race scholars out there do. Um, I speak from what I what I what I um, saw and what I and how I understood it, um, and it comes from that place. Yeah, absolutely. You talk about being in conversation with your dad throughout the whole book, but you also um, you are not backwards and coming forward, and you're very explicit about this being a, a book for black fellas. Mm. And you use terminology and references in this book that only black fellas will understand. One being, you know, that the idea of doing up your hair in a bun and putting bike pants on. There was no footnotes for things like this, right? Uh, and you talk about, um, about things that are innately black. Um, was this a purposeful thing when you wrote this book or did you ever think about, well, what might the white folks, what if they don't get it? Well, I certainly didn't. The goal was, I think, <laughs> sorry. Um, so uh, what I learned, I'm doing Wild Black Woman, when we were doing that, that radio show, um, we made, me and Angelina made a decision that this radio show was going to be a show for black women. Mm. Like we're just, and when we're, when we're doing, whatever we're doing was always going to be for that audience, um, for us, because we deserve something too, surely. And, um, and uh, what, I, what I saw from that is that, um, you know, stuff that's made for us, it still has an appeal for other people anyway. They still get something out of it. It's, we're just not being of service to in the first instance, which, uh, you know, sometimes I think we, some of us have been trained to think like that and we can't get out of that idea of that of domestic service. Um, and so for me, it was like, well, no, I'm going to do this book and I'm going to make it for a black audience. Um, as a black academic, it used to make me wild. I'd come and I'd teach um, Indigenous studies and the classroom would be mostly white fellas. And I'd go home exhausted and then thinking, well, why am I, what am I doing? Like, what is the purpose of my intellectual labour? Who is it of service to? Mm. Um, and so I always hated the idea that, yeah, you've made it as an academic, but who are you doing work for? And that the work I was doing for my own community happened outside after hours when I was exhausted, you know? Um, uh, my kids got the worst of me when I was tired when I came home labouring all day for the settlers. And so um, I, I've been... Uh, very focused now in terms of my work of who, who am I of service to. Um, it's, no, it's not appealing um, uh, to settlers. Um, it, it's being of service to mob in all kinds of ways. And um, I wanted to write a book where I could speak with my own people, you know, like, um, and as an academic, you're trained to speak in a way that disconnects us from our own knowledge. Um, that and, and it's not discernible. And, and so I'm like, I'm sure I wasn't put here to tell stories about us that we couldn't even 
laugh with, engage with, understand. Um, and look, there are some chapters that are a bit like a bit more academic-y in that traditional sense. Um, so just gloss over those ones. Because <laughs> uh, those ones are just there for spite. Um, in the journal that wouldn't yeah. publish me. But um, so, you know, there's, a, there's definitely a chapter that's performing to an academic audience in the traditional, I can't even say it like that, but, you know, mm -hmm. performing to that kind of audience because it was a, a chapter they refused to, refused to publish. Um, but I, m my goal was I, I, I want my kids to be able to read this and get it. Like, they've had the journey on this all the way through. Um, and I, there's a thing in the publishing world that apparently it's white women who buy books. And so there's this thing where authors pander to white women to sell books. Um, and I'm, I'm not appealing to a market in that sense. Um, I want black fellas to steal this book from each other, you know. Like, ah! I, I want it to be worn. I want it to be used and engaged with I, 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 um, and grappled with and um, I'm happy to argue over it and, like, talk about it. Like, you know, like, you know, I, I want to be challenged on it. Like, go, hang on, what about that? Like, that's what I wrote it as a provocation mm. to be in conversation with each other about, well, how do we survive in this place? Um, and how to, and also model how we can tell our stories and, and, and take our place. Um, and that there are, we all have different experiences of this world and they can all coexist, even if they're different. Um, so I'm excited about like the kitchen table conversations we get to have as a result of reading this. And, and I'm mindful that the book was officially published yesterday and I know not everyone in the room or online um, has had a chance to read it yet, but when I say it will do things to you, I, I really mean that. And um, I'd come home from work and, and I'd get into the manuscript, which, I, which you were so um, grateful and generous in letting me read, and I just, what I'm saying is sit there, not even with the tissue, just sit there with a the tea towel. <laughs> <laughs> You know, you know, black fellas don't play, hey. <laughs> tea towel. Yeah, yeah. yeah, never mind that little tissue. Uh, grab that big tea towel <laughs> and sit there. Why the way them pants? Um, I didn't mean to do that. No, oh, I did you? No, yeah. <laughs> um, sis, you, you touched on this um, already. You've spoken about being, um, you know, you talk about in the book being arrested in Dolby. You talk about um, the event that took place in Fortitude Valley um, one night not too long ago. Um which have, you know, different things have led to racial discrimination cases um, and, and, and other things. Chapter four titled um, Racial Violence, Victims and Victors. You talk about doing things on our terms and you write, and I quote, but I was reminded during this time by Arnie Lilla Watson of the importance of operating on our terms because when we operate on theirs, <clears throat> when we operate on theirs, we have already lost when we operate on our terms, we are reminded that we already know more than them. Charles, in what ways does that being grounded and reminding of who the F we are um, help you shape not just your work, but your thinking, your raising of children and, you know, operating in the world? Yeah, there's um, quite a few, I think, times that I reflect on about, and then I remembered who the F I was. Um, uh, sometimes it's um, when everything's against you and sometimes I'm, I'm strongest when um, everything's against me. I kind of, I, I don't mind that kind of fight. Up against the ropes? Yeah, up against the ropes. Mm. I don't mind, mind that. Um, it's when I come out swinging the best. Um, but there are other times in the midst of the fight that I think you can forget, you can forget who you are. Um, particularly if that fight involves having to subscribe to rules that are set up for you to lose. And it was it, at this time I was in the midst of still making a decision about going forward on these cases and I landed at Annie um, Lilla's kitchen table and um, she didn't tell me what to do, um, but there were various stages in the process where I would land at her table um, and times where I thought I was really strong and fighting where she kind of went... So what do you mean by winning, though? And it just shut me. Like, I was like, oh, I, I'd forgotten who I was in the midst of this because I wanted to win in the way in which they understand winning. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that really shaped that writing that Mianjin essay about one of the cases in terms of, you know what, I'm not handing that over to them, even though I can beat them. Mm. <laughs> mm. I, I would have won it. I'm just going to say. <laughs> I would have won it. So I get this feeling had, you like to win. Had it not been for the NTEU, I'm telling you, we would have got it. Um, but that's a whole other story. That's a whole other story. They're going to get another chapter if you wait. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. That, that's for the next book. They, uh, got, they got off lightly. Yeah, I'll tell you yeah, what, yeah. they got off lightly. That'll be um, another night in the column. But that story hasn't been told. 
Uh, talking um, about other stories. Uh, <laughs> See how you move on. I'm, I'm, I'm ready. Let's warm up. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And then we're going. No. Uh, <laughs> talk, uh, talking about other stories, uh, your chapter titled Ambiguously Indigenous. Um, and I was going to message you last night, but I know you're at awards nights. Uh, congratulations, by the way. Eli. Yeah. Okay. I can have to watch <laughs> um, oh, I was reading. You wait until you get to this chapter. And I was reading it and I was lolling to myself and I was going, no, well, I forgot she put that in there. <laughs> um, chapter um, titled Ambiguously Indigenous um, talks about, you know, um, newly identifying black fellas and the role that they play in the colony, but also um, the dangers that they could bring to um, diluting who we are as a people uh, because they haven't operated on our terms. Charles, are you worried about what this chapter might bring up? Um, not, not just for, <laughs> for yourself. It could be a defamation case. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I like the part that... But I part... could be talking about anyone yeah, in yeah. my defence. Um, yeah. Look, not, not everyone will like this chapter, um, yeah. but it's, it's, this is our conversation that we're having yeah. and we need to have it. Um, and, yes, there was a lot of thought that went into it and a lot of um, discussions and it wasn't just, oh, I'm just going to say what I want. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of thought given to um, that chapter. And um, what I wanted to do was not, um, you know, attack people who are on their identity journey, um, but actually explain the function of the ancestry, ancestry Aborigine in terms of um, settler colonial institutions. There's a reason why they're preferred over those who ontologically are Indigenous. It serves a function. Um, so it's, it, this is not about individual people's stories. This is about the settler colonial state and its violence. Um, and so if people who are troubled by it need to move out of our fields to think about how this is operating, because it is really violent. You will see, and you know, in a lot of institutions, we don't see traditional owners at the forefront employed in paid positions, in management, in leadership positions always from somewhere else or nowhere else. Mm. Now, as black fellas, we know the violence of the native police. They were brought from other areas to visit the most violence upon us so that we wouldn't remember who were the ones that ordered that violence in the first place. Um, so if we, if we think about what's the function of this thing that a lot of us are grappling with, what do we do about it? This does not mean then we, you know, people can't go on their journey, can't find ancestry, can't, because we're all, all black fellas are finding bloodlines, connections, you know, all the time. That's, that's what, we're all doing that work. Um, but we have to recognise the limitations of our knowing and all of us do as black fellas. And unfortunately, there are people who have not been raised that way and are disregarding those protocols that are being empowered by colonial institutions to visit violence upon black fellas. And we need to have that conversation without being afraid to be, you know, that the likes of Andrew Bolt are going to use that against us. This is not a conversation with him. This is a conversation we need to have with each other. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And Charles, when you, when you talk about... Also, um, it's not lateral violence. I'm just going to say that. Yeah, it's yeah, not yeah, lateral yeah, violence. Yeah. It's so, a conversation we need to have. So save your tears. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. <laughs> And your emotional emails. Nah. You, please don't email me. <laughs> yeah, don't. <laughs> I've seen her inbox. Not, not on that issue, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Charles, a lot of your work conjures up, I, I, mean, I've, I have the privilege of um, not just being your friend, but uh, your colleague, um, co-director at Institute of Collaborative Race Research. Um, a lot of your writing makes people feel a kind of way. I know it makes me feel a kind of way. Um, Another Day in the Colony really made me feel... Um, I've not read books that are written like this before. And, like, I mean, we catch up at marches and stuff in between the manuscript, and I'm like, Charles, like, this chapter, and then I go like this on my arm, like, goosebumps <laughs> all over. And then we'd be standing, I don't know what people thought, you know, looking in, because we'd be like, oh, yeah, the goosebumps, the goosebumps. You'd be like, yeah. Do you, um, how do you, how do you, um, or do you feel, if any, a responsibility to how people might receive the stuff that you read and the stuff that you, uh, sorry, the stuff that you write? Um, not just in Another Day in the Colony, but all your work, because you're a prolific writer across many mediums. Yeah. You know, I take very seriously the responsibility around writing and speaking and, the, and grabbing the mic. Um, and, um, you, you know, you don't always know um, how, what your work's going to do. I think um, just recently, the Meandernes, they just blew me away in terms of um, 
what it did for other blackfellas. Mm. I know what it did for me. It, you know, I wrote it from my experience, but I was thinking about other blackfellas who I know are going through that experience of dealing with racism and feeling really powerless by it. And so I, I did write it with the audience in mind of you know, who I was writing for. Like, I know who I'm writing for. Not everybody. I'm writing for particular um, people. And so I, I knew that, um, but I was really, ex um, I think, exhausted. I was really um, over overwhelmed by the response that that got um, in, in terms of how people, what, how they shared what it did for them. And I, and it, I yeah, hadn't had that experience before. Like, I, you know, people go, oh, that was, you know, people yeah. give you compliments and stuff. But um, so, yeah, I, um, I was surprised by that. But I, I mean, I still take... I, I think about how people experience this. There were times where bless um, a lot of my writing. Uh, so my ex Matthew, he's he's heard most of my work, um, even the book, and I and I'd read it out loud, and if he didn't go, mm, <laughs> then I knew I didn't get it. Like I hadn't hit hit the audience, um, and um, so I've I've always made sure it's been tested with the black audience first. Um, and that I've been held accountable and, and critiqued. Um, that's why I'm, I'm so grateful to Uncle Shane and Auntie Lilla for taking the time to read every page of that book and turn the page with me and sit there. Um, and, you know, um, the, the, the feedback, um, I had to change stuff, I had to fix things. You know, they'd say, oh, that's good, bub. Um, I, had, I still remember going to Auntie Lil's and I still remember going to say this, but I'd handed the manuscript. I think I was just getting her to have a look at like the bits where I'd referenced her or something. Oh, that's what I thought. And I handed it to her. And while I was there, she was going to have a rest. And while I was there and the kids were mucking around, um, uh, she started reading while I was there. And I started to get really scared. And she, she came out and she called me and she goes, Chelsea. And she goes, is this published yet? And I said, oh, no. And she goes, good. <laughs> ah! That's what you want to hear when you're three quarters of the way through a book. It was the worst feeling. Um, and then later on, I was still there. She come out and she and yarned me. And then, and then we had another sit down yarn. We, we went through the, the pages and stuff. And um, black critique is such a gift. Um, we're writing for black fellows. We've got to check in with our mob first before it goes out there. Because um, we're not, all not perfect and we make mistakes and um, we're all learning, trying to make sense of this place. And so I'm just really grateful that I had that intellectual mentorship and guidance, particularly from um, sovereign black fellows who know the violence of the academy and ontologically are black. Um, it's For not always... Who don't know what ontologically means. Just in, in, Sorry, sorry. Um, I'm trying to avoid looking at Carla. That's why I'm not looking this way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Carla, can you sit that side, Yeah, sorry. Please? You should have gone elsewhere. So it's kind of like as a way of being, just in your being. Um, and so, um, yeah, to have... have um, mob that know those, because not everyone knows, as black fellas, knows what it's like to be in these institutions. Um, you might feel when you come on here, it just feels a bit weird, what is this place? Um, we still feel that sometimes about why we're in this place and how weird it is. Um, so it's just nice to have people who have been in the academy before I got there, who know the story, but also know um, what it is to be and reminded me of, of my own power and strength. And um, th that was such a gift. In the, the gift of the critique was reminding me of my own power and strength. But in the course of that, I had to be told the limitations of my knowing in order to, to come to that. And that's the beauty of black critique is that um, it's honest, um, truthful, hurts a little bit. <laughs> um, but then when it comes out, when you come out, you know, if I, if I, can, if I can do, if I've met that marker of excellence, then... Well, you know, the likes of Andrew Bolt or whatever can come for me because I'm good. And so having that, that, that grounding, it's like the rouse I had with my dad over the curry mail at the kitchen table, that was training so that when we get out there, we can hold our own um, because it is a fight every day in this place. Absolutely. Chelsea, you inspire so many of us. Um, and I know in the room today we've got... Um, people who have inspired you, Vernon R. Key. Uh, we've got uh, Dr. Fiona Foley, Foley. in the room to, uh, today. Uh, you speak of others, um, especially you, you often highlight black fellows in this place and the work that inspired you, and as opposed to looking elsewhere, um, which is often done when um, black thinkers in this place do, right? Um, who are the people that come before you, Charles, that um, have really, in terms of um, the intellectual work or, or their artistry or their activism, um, because we know that, sovereign people don't 
always um, sovereign people are everywhere, right? Um, Absolutely. Who, who are the people that have inspired you um, in your professional career that's led to where we are now? Well, there's lots. Now I'm getting in trouble because I won't name everybody. Um, I have to say um, my, my, my undergrad training uh, was in an, uh, a very uh, boutique uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health degree program of like 15 people per year. Um, uh, Professor Mark Bruff, who's here, was one of my lecturers when I was 17. Um, shout out to Debbie Kilroy, who Joe Kilroy. I got to sit in a classroom with, with Joe Kilroy as a 17-year-old and watch lecturers come in telling us about who we were and blackfellas just roll on them every time. And this was at, an, at, at, at a university and just watch blackfellas go, no, that's not how it is and spoke from experience, spoke from place. So I had a really good training ground at, um, in this kind of institution and sadly we don't have these courses anymore because we've all been mainstreamed and everything's wonderful. But those um, specific Indigenous educational environments were such important training grounds for um, a lot of us and that group that graduated from that degree program have gone on to do some really amazing things and are very different to most of the, their peers and I credit that to black training grounds, those black educational environments. I think that's why him but Yumba, you fellas are so blessed that every day you go to school and you see people that look like you every day. Mm. Um, and you don't have to pretend to be someone else when you come to school, um, that it's embedded. Carla, stop. Oh, no. <laughs> yes, Carla, <laughs> this one too. Don't look at her. Don't look at her. Hey. Because it's so rare. You know, we don't get to think out loud together. We don't have these spaces where we can do that. Yeah. Um, and so I, I credit that, and then I, and then I could see other people who were like that and go, oh, yeah. Um, and so yeah, it's, I had to, I mean the number of um, copyright permissions I had to get from artists and performers because I was cite that's who I cited. Um, it wasn't citing the the great race scholars from elsewhere, though some are there. And I credit that to um, Dr. David Singh, who has really in, introduced me to to readings around race, with always with the warning to don't don't just take it, don't just adopt it wholesale. Um, think about it, but think about it in relation to your own experience. Um, and so I've, I've just been blessed with some um, just really amazing critical thinkers who've encouraged me to, um, to think differently about things and not just copy what other people are saying and, you know, repeat what other people have already said. Absolutely. Mm. I'm mindful that we are, we only do have a few minutes left, um, Chels, but I wanted to end on this question. Um, only a few pages in, you, um, you've dedicated this book to two black men who have influenced and shaped your life in unmeasurable ways, Charles. I'm speaking, of course, of your father, Uncle Vern, what a go, who's passed and not, no longer with us, and your ex-husband and your, your close friend also, Matthew Bond. Why was it important, Charles, to uh, dedicate this book to those men in your life? Thanks, Kevin. <laughs> Anyone got a tea towel? These lashes aren't going to hold out. They're not going to hold out. Um, it was going to be my first question. I went, no, don't do don't that. Don't start the night. Little word. I wasn't ready. <laughs> um, look, uh, it, it, this story is framed by the, the, the home I grew up in and the home that we created for our own kids. Um, so, of course... Of course. Um, and so much of it is drawn, I mean, I talk about my own experiences, but so much is, of it is drawn from learning from the violence that they were subject to as black men in this place. Um, you know, as black women, we like to drag black men sometimes. Um, <laughs> I, don't, I couldn't tell by your timelines. <laughs> but same time, we'll fight for them. Um, we'll fight for them. You know, Indigenous dads, we'll, we'll, we'll fight for our men too and our sons. And um, so much of what I've learned about race and racial violence um, has been the particular kind of violence that is levelled at black men who look distinctly black in this place. Um, the white, and it doesn't matter whether you're a truck driver or a police officer. Um, it doesn't matter. Um, and to see the indignities meted out to them. Yeah. That's, you know, and, and so that's why sometimes you see at the violence of those who've just discovered who they are to those who've lived it every day. Um, there's, a, there's a limitation in the knowing. There's a difference in the knowing. If you don't declare it, then there's a violence in that as well to, 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 to not recognise um, 
what it's like to be in that body all the time and to never be able to escape it, you know, never to be able to sort of dress down or dress up to be able to escape that racialized location that you're placed in. Um, and so, yeah, it, um, of course I would have to um, dedicate this book to them because um, they paid the price for the learnings that I got too. Thank you, Chelsea. <laughs> Thank you for that one. <laughs> Folks, um, we've only got about 48 seconds left. <laughs> um, my director and producer is in my ear. Oh, not in my ear, she's over here. <laughs> <laughs> I always make out like I'm on a TV show. I'm like, where's my camera? Where's my camera? <laughs> Calm down, you're at university. Um, <laughs> Charles, before we do, before we do wrap up, um, are there any final thoughts or comments or um, things that you want to share with anyone in the audience or in, online? Because we've got a massive, massive audience online as well that are watching. Um, I just want to um, just thank Blackfellas for the love, um, the love for me and my family. <sighs> I'm going to get over this. See how staunch I am? Um, <laughs> hey. um, but the love for um, this book and the journey along the way, like um, also the impatience that I do about the book, um, I, I just I'm overwhelmed and the, the fact that you know you you can't find this book right now at the suburban bookstore on a shelf but it went into read from the day of publication because black fellas had gone silly for it and ordering it and people say I pre-ordered in July where's my book yeah um, <laughs> the number of dms I get on the day <laughs> I'm like I'm not Dimix. um <laughs> I posted something and everyone was like when did you get yours <laughs> Okay, calm down. Um, but the love, like, and, and just shows the power of black fellas. Um, and so I'm just really, really grateful for the love that has been shown um, to me from mob all over the place. Um, talking of a book they have yet to read, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. you could be disappointed. <laughs> um, so sorry about it. But, um, yeah, so I just um, just want to, uh, yeah, I'm just so grateful for the love of, love of my own people. Sorry, let Put your hands together for Professor Chelsea Wadiga. <laughs> whole team um, behind us putting this together. Um, I'd like to give a shout out to QUT Library, um, QUT Faculty of Health, QUT um, Indigenous Health Unit, um, and specifically Kari Melbourne, Kate, Associate Professor Deb Duffy, and our friend QUT Librarian Nicole as well. So thank you very much for putting this together. And on behalf of QUT, um, again, thank you, Chelsea, and um, thank you for being so generous and inviting us along and getting, um, allowing us to be a part of this experience with you. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, thank you so much. <laughs>